Hello, Alex. Welcome to the Creative Insider podcast. Hey, good to be here. Uh, so you are one of the basically biggest mentors in the world to everyone that has studied <laughs> architecture. You have a great responsibility. And when I started the podcast, I did sort of a list of people that I might talk to. And you were on that list. And uh, I have to say, I mean, at first it, you were not like, I, I needed to train a little bit to be able to do this podcast better before <laughs> I ask you. But you're also very hard to track down. You're doing some sort of a social media, um, what is it called? De detox or what is it? What's up? No, I, so I've deleted all social media off my phone because I, I was, you know, like anybody I'm checking, I was checking it just 24 seven. Um, and it was just anytime I it was opening up a program, Photoshop waiting for something to open up. You, you just naturally pull your phone out and just check stuff. And it just got to the point where like, this is killing my like productivity, my efficiency. Um, and it was just kind of, it, even when I was at home, you know, watching TV or whatever, I was just constantly pulling it out. And, um, I've slowly just been deleting everything off of it. Um, and so like I started with Facebook, that was like the first one. Um, I just recently did Instagram. I did basically anything on my phone, like even New York times, like, uh, news agencies. Like I just deleted all that stuff off there. Cause I don't want to be picking up my phone every five minutes to check something, to get that in, uh, what's it called? The, um, the, the dopamine, dopamine rush. The yeah, dopamine, dopamine rush. Yeah. yeah. So I am just trying to disconnect from everything, basically. How, how long did it um, take you to like stop doing it? Because I've done it sometimes too to delete everything. But there is like this, it's sort of like a habit that you just pull it out and yeah. then you just don't find what you're supposed to click. So how, how long it took you to, to, to get rid of that habit? So what I found is I thought Facebook was the issue. So I deleted Facebook and I just moved right to the next thing I had on my phone. So then that was Instagram. And I was like, okay, well, once I get it rid of Instagram, then I'll stop kind of pulling this phone out. And once I deleted that, then I just started going to all the, like the New York times that I had on my phone. And so I realized I have to get everything off. Like, cause you just move to something else. Cause you, you already have that, that craving built into you. And so when you delete it, you just move to something else. Um, so I had, I just like, no joke last week, just deleted New York, the last thing, like the New York times. Cause I found myself any spare second I had, I was oddly enough, just going to the New York times and <laughs> reading what was on there. Um, so now, now it's starting to, work like i know that there's no point in me pulling out my phone because there's nothing on there <laughs> to look at except emails and i hate looking at emails so um that's kind of where i'm at I, I it really i could see just like how addicting this stuff is and so yeah, yeah. it's it's crazy that it uh caught you uh on guard too because like i mean uh, for for the few people that probably don't know you, you're the person behind the blog uh, Visualizing Architecture, and you pull out so so much content, and you have to think it through. So I guess this is also like something that um, uh, it's something that's damaging you, right? Because you you have to really have your concentration, and this distracts you because you instead of having the ability to think, you are consuming the thoughts of someone else. Yes. So I, so I guess, um, I guess, yeah, it's very tricky because you, for, for example, me, I have to kind of use it for the podcast because I share stuff, try to promote sure. the episodes. So it's, it's really like, uh, yeah, I probably should do the same thing. I have to be honest. Like I probably should start deleting. I deleted, uh, uh, YouTube studio because I was checking <laughs> stats. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'm going to delete YouTube studio at least. No, uh, I mean, Instagram, Instagram was one of the worst in terms of me looking at it. Um, and I realized it was really 
uh, we'll, we can probably get into this later about how the fact that I haven't done a post on my website in probably more than a year. Um, but the Instagram, I was just following so many visualization studios and just looking at what they're doing. And you just, you see how many people are doing amazing work that it's almost deflating. <laughs> like, cause you want to do unique amazing stuff and it's hard when you see so many i mean just hundreds and hundreds of different people in studios every time they post something it's just gorgeous and at a certain point like you feel like a how can you compete against this but then b how can you do something unique when it seems like everything unique is already out it's like i don't know it was really like uh I don't deflating is the wrong word, but it's just kind of beating me down. And so I just had to like turn it off. Cause when, when I didn't have Instagram before the era of Instagram and even Facebook, like I just, I felt more like free to try stuff out. And even if it existed out there in the world, I didn't really know it. And so it was much easier to like put stuff out there and get excited about it. And now it's just like, there's just too many good people out there doing such good work yeah I've, I've been thinking about this isn't it like kind of wrong for example so i work in i work as an architectural designer i'm not so much in the architectural visualization industry but um nowadays like it seems like the first step to every design or to everything you do is to go whether on pinterest or on instagram and collect some images um that you um yeah that that inspires you and then based on those start creating instead of just first start creating and maybe then when you get stuck uh, to 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 sort of use it for getting unstuck somehow like you know what i mean like yeah if well that's what i used to do in the past is like i would find ideas like you know there's like maybe a couple of play I, I i have this folder that i just dump like really beautiful images, diagrams, that kind of stuff into. And I mean, it's, it's gotten huge, but that, that's kind of like, I would just dump stuff in there and I would always kind of, if I wanted to make something or create something, I would start just kind of browsing through there and it would just kind of get some ideas flowing. And then I kind of use something as a starting point and I almost always ended up just like going a completely different direction, but at least got me going um, but now I think maybe the better way to explain it is, you know, how we were talking about, you know, you, you go on Instagram or Facebook and you kind of get that quick hit, that dopamine rush. It's almost like Instagram was giving me that dopamine rush and therefore like my own work wasn't doing anything for me anymore. I don't know. That's kind of my theory. Like, no, I yeah, just, yeah. I just could not get excited for anything I was doing. Like, it just wasn't giving me that that rush. And then you go on Instagram and you look at all these beautiful images, and it's just like, oh, that's beautiful. Oh, that's beautiful. And then you close out Instagram, and you're good to go for a little while until you get that craving again. And my own work just wasn't doing that anymore. Yeah, it's kind of for me what it does is like um because I know how much uh time and work and maybe multiple people have been working on a project or an image and it also a little bit uh pushed me down in the motivation to do it myself because I think oh this will take so much time and then they pull out so often new images that you think how did they do it like uh every day um they do a crazy image and to me, this is like interesting to hear it in the um, in the field in the professional field for you because now the problem is it happens to a lot of like um, young people, right? Like for example, sure. uh, because the it's one thing if you just see beautiful renderings and you're a little bit uh, demotivated into doing them themselves, but for example, for young girls or young boys, it's very uh, depressing to see all these like perfect pictures of this perfect uh bodies and um i don't know it's it's um i think that mentally it's gonna be really tough in the future there will be um now they do something like a new they're doing some new social media that it's competing with instagram what i've heard 
It's called um, Be Real. So when you post a picture, automatically post like a picture of like not only the camera you want, but also on the opposite camera of your phone. So that kind of shows like Instagram versus okay. reality. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like a very interesting uh, project that it's going on. Um, yeah. I I, I don't know. I have really mixed emotions. I, I, I see what this all did to me. Um, so I, I definitely have a bad taste in my mouth about all this stuff. And then obviously I have two kids and now I, you know, my, my experience is like, okay, if I, if they're going to be productive, if they're going to like really focus on stuff growing up, you know, you almost got to keep them away from all this because it just, I, I don't know. It just seems to me like it just destroys productivity. It destroys like, I don't know, focus, attention spans, all that kind of stuff. It makes and me that, nervous. How, how has it changed for you since you stop and delete everything? Like, I do you feel like now more energized, more? Yes. So le- again, less, I, less anxious, I guess. Facebook, like I, I took off maybe a year and a half ago and then Instagram was maybe like six months ago. And then New York times was last week. (laughs) Um, I already am feeling kind of that desire to get back in. So I have an office up in my uh, third floor of our house and that's where I do all my website work. And I'm feeling that like craving to get back out there and start producing again. Cause it's been, uh, Oh man, probably well over a year now that I've done anything for the website. Um, and it's all kind of come out of kind of all this stuff that we've been talking about, but then also like my kids are getting older and it's just so much, I, I do so much work at the office that it's hard to come home and not hang out with the kids and instead go upstairs and keep producing for the website. So there's kind of like a lot of different variables that are causing me to really slow down on stuff I'm doing for the website. But it's, you know, it's kind of two pronged. It's the kids spending more time with them, kind of changing priorities in life, but then also all the social media just burning me out and kind of reducing that like craving to, to keep producing. Yeah, I've read a great book about this topic. It's from Carl Newport. He's like a professor teaching um, some sort of informatics. And um, he did this work where he explained exactly about this. Um, what did he call it? A digital detox where you just go 30 days without anything just to check mm-hmm. it out how you feel. Um, and that he was saying that, that when you start getting bored, because you don't have anything to check, anything to do, you, you start, you have to fill out your time with something and then you start, um, just uh, doing it yourself. Like rather it's going to be a hobby or in like in your case, it's, um, uh, the website, your website, uh, visualizing architecture. Um, but I, I was curious, like, because, uh, I like to, you know, start from a little bit of the origins of each of of my guests uh what was the case with you why did you decide that you wanted to become a professional architect or a designer is it somebody in your family already involved into these fields or what was the case for you i mean i did so no no one in my family was in architecture or or even artists my brother is an architect but you know we were kind of growing up at the same time and we were both creative people and we're kind of feeding off each other. But, you know, I didn't go into architecture because of him. It was, it just seemed like the, the only thing that kind of combined artistry with, uh, building. Cause I really liked those two things growing up. Um, so I just kind of always from a young age kind of knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, and so then I just naturally, once I graduated high school, I was looking for a college. Um, I just took the first college I found, which was real close to where I grew up. And that was and they had an architecture program. So I just went right into that. I mean, it wasn't like this soul searching thing that I did when I was younger. It's just I always kind of knew I was going to be an architect. 
And I just kind of took the easiest path, which was this college right by where I grew up. Um, and then as I got deeper into that program, so I got my bachelor's degree from Bowling Green State University, which was the university right where I grew up. Um, once I got towards the end of that, I really liked kind of architecture and decided to get my master's in it. And then I went to Miami University, which was maybe like a three hour drive from where I grew up. Um, and that's kind of where my passion for architecture came out of was when I got my master's, believe it or not. Cause I, when I was getting my undergraduate degree, we were required to have internships at architecture firms. And so I worked at architecture firms and it wasn't, wasn't as great as I thought it was going to be. Um, but then when I went to Miami and got my master's, I don't know, something changed and I got really excited about it again. Um, so yeah, when I graduated, that's when I moved out here to Boston and started working for an architect for about, I think I was there for four or five years. Um, and that's when I really realized I didn't want to be an architect. (laughs) I was actually doing it full time as a career. Um, it was, I worked for a small boutique office. Um, they did really high end residential and some commercial, and because it's a small office, I kind of managed all aspects of the process. So I did um, drawings, lots of design work, um, and then also administrative work. So like managing the contractors and all that kind of stuff. And, the, you know, the design work obviously was a lot of fun. And, the you know, even doing the drawings was okay. I mean, that's just, doing drawings is brutal. Um, there's just so much to know, so much code and all that kind of stuff, but it was kind of the dealing with the clients and the administrative work and dealing with contractors and going to the site and making sure stuff was being done properly and kind of that whole aspect that I just really didn't like. Um, and the more I did it, the more I realized as you move up in architecture and as you move to higher positions, that's kind of all you end up doing is kind of the managing of clients and managing of the contractors in that aspect. So you you end up doing a lot more percentage of your time on the stuff I hated. And so I, I kind of knew after about four years that that was not what I wanted to do. Um, And so then that's when, uh, my business partner now, Andrew, he was running a visualization office here in Boston by himself. And he reached out to me cause I was my, by then my website was pretty popular and he knew about me and his office was actually, you know, five blocks from where my office at this architects, um, at this architectural firm was. So he just reached out to me, wanted to have coffee um, at that point I had no idea doing visualization full time was like something that was actually real. Like I was running this blog, but I didn't really know that I could do this full time. And so he reached out to me. He's like, Hey, would you want to come, you know, work with me and do this, do visualization full time. And he's like, the timing was just perfect. Cause I was, you know, at this architecture office, I was, you know, there was times I was doing 80 hour weeks. Like it was just crazy hours, lots of overtime. I was getting burnt out, just didn't like it. And so I just, I'm not the type of person to just up and leave an entire field (laughs) that I've been like going to school and getting my master's for. Like, I'm just not that kind of person to kind of quit on something after only four years. Um, but it just, I made the decision. I was like, I'm, I'm going to try this out. I'm going to try to do visualization full time. And I mean, by far the best decision I ever made because, you know, doing visualization is every week you're working on a whole new list of different projects. You're working on so many different types of architecture. You're collaborating with like the architects of these firms. So, I mean, the amount of clients we have and the amount of different, like powerful or important people you're interacting with and you're, you know, talking with, it's just, 
it's so much more interesting in the turnover rate, like just the kinds of projects and how quickly you're moving on to the next thing. Again, that dopamine rush, like we're in architecture. It's, you know, you're designing a building for a year or two, you know, in visualization you're every week, it's like something there. So just that kind of whole aspect of things was so much more interesting and exciting. And, you know, visualization was something I love. So it was very easy to just kind of fall in love with this career. And once I made that move, it, it, you know, there was no going back to architecture again. Um, As uh, somebody that's in architecture, I can confirm that it's the way you said, but I can uh defend a little bit that career sure. path by saying that um as you say for sure doing one of the downsides of working as a architectural designer uh, it's as you said the process is pretty long and involves also a lot of tasks that are not so pleasant like all the documentation for construction permit and then all the construction documentation and stuff like that but um what for me personally uh, i like about it it's that you go with your team, like I work on bigger scale projects there, like oh, yeah. bigger buildings, and you have this team and um, especially if the team is working well together and if you have a good spirit, uh, you go through so many difficulties and so many stressful moments because um, for from the moment where you guys do the visualization to the moment where we turn that visualization into actual uh concrete bricks and facades and everything it takes a long uh, a lot uh, but it's so beautiful when you get on the end of the construction site and you see yeah. every single thing you have thought through and it was executed and you fought for for the aesthetics for the design that's also yeah. like something that uh it's more like do you like to run the 100 meters or do you like to run a marathon it's like yeah. two different uh sports more or less but well, I, uh, yeah. I often think, too, if I had not started in a small office but instead worked at, like, a larger office, you know, where like a Perkins & Will, Gensler, SOM, something bigger, would my feelings been different? Because I wouldn't have been, you know, I probably definitely wouldn't have been doing administrative coordination with contractors and stuff. I would have been doing, you know – not necessarily pigeonholed, but I would have been focused on one area of architecture and maybe I would have eventually found an area that I really liked and wanted to stay in or kind of, I don't know, maybe my experience would have been different in a, in a bigger office, but I will say the, the projects I did work on all the way through once they were built, I never had that like emotion of excitement of like, all right, it's finally here. It's finally built. I was so exhausted at the end of the process every time that I was just like, thank God this is over. <laughs> it, I, it's so sad. Like it's so sad because as a kid growing up, that was my, like it's what I wanted to do. And then to kind of get there and not be excited about this thing that as a kid, you always wanted to be, I don't know. It's kind of sad. But I think it's kind of great that you decided to do this shift before it was too late. Like yeah. a lot of people end up doing something because they're supposed to uh, instead of switching. And um, and I think that's even worse because then you end up hating it even more. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I guess that in every job there are moments where you're happier or less happy. Uh, so, I mean, I'm somebody that likes both sides. I think that... Mm, I w I would like to like shift between the two things more often because I think that if I move to to your side of the work where I have to just um, visualize other projects, it will be exciting to, as you said, to have this constantly change and shift of tasks and completely new project, completely new challenge. But I also at some point I would miss like the, you know, entering the building i've designed and be like oh yep. i designed this so i yep. think um, for me it's really tricky i don't know yet what i want to do yeah <laughs> um sure. but you you mentioned that when the moment you shift um uh, you were already uh, you have already started your blog and it was pretty popular and and you said something like um you didn't know that you could make money out of it wasn't your blog with this popularity or isn't your blog with this big popularity that it has because literally I don't know. I'm based in Europe, so so far away from 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 the states, and everyone at least once have 
been on your blog and they have looked at especially the old school stuff and yep. they're still very helpful. Didn't you start monetizing that website or aren't you monetizing this website since the fir the early stages it was so popular or just it was for you like something that you like doing and Yeah, so when I first started, I mean it took a couple of years to kind of build up to a relatively decent decent audience. Um and then at a certain point I tried <clears throat> doing ads, like just Google ads on it. Um, it never f really felt quite right. I never really made money on the Google ads. Like we're talking like $20 a month, like very, very small amounts. Google ads is not the way to go when you, at least in my experience, when you're trying to monetize it, you kind of need to find, I'm trying to think of what the other, there's like a website that helps you buy and sell ads. I think was this website where like you would kind of post, uh, advertising spots on your website to this like it's it was like a website where you bring together advertisers and um creators and uh i tried that and that was a you could make a lot more money if you found the right advertiser that wanted to spend a decent amount of money advertising on your website but i was never really able to uh make that work either and it, at a certain point, I was just like, you know what? I don't really care. <laughs> I really don't care about making uh, money on this thing. And so at a certain point when that was all just kind of fizzling out, I just kind of deleted all the ads off the site because they really ruined the look of a website. Um, you're constantly trying to throw all these little ugly things all over on all these pages. And um, when I rebuilt the website, uh, I, I used to have it in Squarespace and then I rebuilt it in, um, now my brain's blinking now, uh, WordPress. I just built yeah. like a custom thing on, in, on WordPress. I just did not even create space for advertising. I just wasn't in, interested in it. Um, I do sell my portfolios on my website, but then it, there again, I really don't make that much money off of them because they're, the it's all print on demand. I don't do like block printing, which that's how you get cost low. I do print on demand and I try not to make these things super expensive. So I basically remove just about all of the profit margin on them um, just to kind of keep costs as low as possible. So I really don't make that much money on the portfolios either. So in, in terms of your question, did I make money off the website uh, next to nothing? I, with the portfolios, I will say that um, they cover the costs of the hosting fee. So I, I break even. Now, um, since I haven't released a portfolio in a while, I don't really sell too much of those anymore. And so now I'm back in the red again in terms of I'm spending way more money on hosting fees and stuff than I am on the money I'm making on that stuff. So in a lot of ways, I'm losing money. <laughs> on the website, but it's fine. I, I really don't need the money and I, I kind of just prefer having like a nice elegant looking website than something that has ads all over it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, didn't that somehow indirectly generated some, uh, yes. income for you because of the awareness? Maybe like, yeah, I, I think you were speaking at the D2 conference, at least at their podcast at some point, or like, I don't know, speaking gigs or teaching, stuff like that. Did that generate at least something like this? Yeah, so that for sure. So, you know, in terms of like directly monetizing the website, no, I never really made money, probably lost way more money than I made over the years. But the getting my name out there, um, especially that long ago, is I'm definitely seeing that now coming back in terms of clients because what happens is all these uh, students that were using my website in school have long graduated and now are working at architecture firms and are aim at, you know, in high positions now are architecture firms. Just last week we had a call with a uh, office 
And it was a big conference call, kind of a project kickoff of the images we're doing. And, you know, the first thing that was said by the guy that was running the meeting was, hey, I'm a huge fan of your website. I, I used it in school. And so we're super excited to be working with you. And that happens all the time. We'll jump on these calls. And the first thing that said is like, hey, I'm a huge fan of your website. So it is definitely in that respect been more than amazing in terms of like paying off in like just building trust with clients right away. You know, they, they almost like feel like they know who we are even before starting work with us just because they've been using my website for so long. Yeah, and also that um, creates some sort of legitimacy for you. Yes. Because like if I... Uh, we're about to assign you with an image, I would be like, okay, this guy had written so many um, blog articles and had uh, showed me how I how he does it. So, yep. um, so I'll be like, yeah, he knows what he's doing. I'm definitely gonna gonna trust uh, his work. And 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 also the fact that you have helped for free so many people, um, they're like willing to you know pay back somehow, I guess. Um, and and yeah. the thing is. I never thought about this, you know, that long ago, never in my, in a million years, a, did I think the website would be big and popular. Um, nor did I know it was big and popular. I, I would see, I would like go into the stats and kind of look at the numbers I was getting and I would see just large amounts of people going there, but that's you just see like graphs. You never really experienced the interaction until I started like traveling around and doing talks and then starting people would just come up to me and say like how happy they were that I was doing this. And that was kind of my first oh wow moment of wow, there's actually people that are using this. It's not just like looking at graphs and numbers. Like I'm there's actually like just hearing you now, like when we started this call and you were saying, you know, you you looked at my stuff and everyone you know has at one point or another used my website. It's still really weird for me to hear that because I'm, st- you know, I haven't looked at my website in over a year. I'm just doing my own work at the office and I go do work, come home, be with the kids and family. It's still weird to me to know that there's so many people kind of around the world that has at least know knows my name or knows my work. It's still really weird to me. Um, I, I'm gonna add more. I have it uh, always on a tab, <laughs> on a special tab where it's like favorites, like uh, I don't know architecture stuff, and it's always there. And I always go to fundamentals, <laughs> and we even use it to. We use it at one of my offices to create like the. We create um, here in Germany. Offices are very efficient, as you might. Uh, imagine and um, we created a photoshop file for like uh, uh, when people do uh, floor plans or elevations to make them nice for competitions and uh, because i was the photoshop expert at, at that office i needed to create a file which everyone can use and then they can easily create uh, images uh, of of their architectures that look Got it. cool and uh, we went to your tutorial about the layer structure in Photoshop okay. <laughs> and, yep. and, and, uh, and we were using it. And that was like, it's just even on a professional level, it's used so much. Um, I know in every office I've been, the people at the competition team, they know all these two, three websites and, and they go on there and uh, learn from there. And it's, and it's crazy how you've done something that it's timeless in a sense, because um it's certainly like about some programs like Photoshop, for example, but it's also a lot about the approach, how you approach things. So the same way you approach them five or six years ago will be today. And, yep. and I think this is something really valuable. But how did you, because you said that you didn't, you weren't so, you were a little bit disenchanted with the architecture at some point between the bachelor and the master. Uh, at what point of your uh, career, or whether it's academical or professional, you decided even doing the the blog? How came this idea? I, it was um, in uh, grad school when I was getting my master's. It was the year before my thesis. We had to do a bunch of work over the summer 
And the professor that I had to present my work to, he was traveling um, abroad. So I needed a way to kind of send him stuff. And I had been wanting to start a website. And I say website in the sense that like creating some sort of presence online, um, like my own space online. I just wanted to like... Which year are we talking about? Uh, like 2009, I think. Um, so I, I created this website and just started dumping my thesis work onto that website to present to him. And it, again, that's why it was started, but it, it never it quickly just turned into this is where I'm going to dump all my ideas. It, it's just weird to think about because I just, I didn't have any direction. I was just dumping images on there. Um, I'd call my mom and I'd be like, Hey, I started a website. Look at the stuff I put on there. And she would, you know, say, Oh, those, those look great. Those look nice. And that's all, I, that's all it was. And then um, at a certain point when I was going through school, like, other like my classmates and stuff, they were always asking me, how are you doing this? How are you doing that? Cause I was doing lot, like interesting visualization for my projects. And I was, you know, just, it was like kind of a level above everyone else's. So there's always people coming to me, like, can you show me how to do this, how to do that? And I was like, okay, there's, there's no place online that's really showing how to do any of this. Like it's just, there's nothing out there. And so that's why I started doing the tutorials just to, get something on there. And once I got like a little bit of momentum, once I started seeing like two or 300 people like went to my website that week, I was like, Oh, well, okay. So there's, there's people actually looking at this stuff. And that was really exciting. And that just kind of got the, the juices flowing got me excited. I just started producing more. I mean, I, I remember there was a time like every week I was creating a new video or creating a new image so I was like churning this stuff out because it was exciting because it, it was really clear the more I put out there, the more people were going and seeing it. Um, and so it was, it was exciting, but the way it started was not this big master plan of, okay, step one, build this huge following. Step two, start a career and use this audience to generate uh, work and projects. No, <laughs> like it was so far the opposite of, it was just me haphazardly throwing stuff together and it just slowly turned into something much bigger. Yeah. But back in the days, this approach was even, a uh, even a thing, right? It, people didn't think that way yet. Like, uh, yeah. I, I think it was very, um, very rare to, to think that way. Um, but did you also, um, when you started doing the website, did you actively work on do some like SEO optimization so that people, when they search it, they find it? Or it was just like a website where you would put the the instructions for how to do things. And then when somebody asks you, you just send them a link and said, here, I had done a website, just enjoy. Uh, n no, I didn't think about that stuff at all. <laughs> um I used Squarespace and it was, Squarespace was in its infancy back then, but they were kind of doing a lot of SEO stuff. Uh, kind of, it was, everything was like a lot of like automated. So I didn't, if I would have tried to start the website in WordPress, there would have been no like optimization for like showing up in Google search results or any, like uh, it probably would have, to be honest, n not grown as fast um, because I use Squarespace, a lot of that was built in. And so the fact that I, I didn't know much about it, it was really good that Squarespace just kind of automatically did a lot of that. But then I also was throwing everything on YouTube and YouTube was generating a lot of traffic and that would in turn send it to the website. So YouTube is kind of where I think a lot of it kind of grew and turned into something bigger. But YouTube wasn't like really a tutorial. It was more like a screen recording of what you would do. And yes, no, again, like it was this, I, I remember like I did like a time lapse of like modeling a tower and I 
just was like, hey, I think this would be cool to kind of do a time lapse. So I just recorded the whole modeling process, and then I threw some tech. Like, again, I was throwing, like, dumbass uh, music in the background of all these videos and just doing text and stuff. I, I, it wasn't I, the most beautiful thing in the, in the I, world. I remember, I remember <laughs> when I found your uh, website, and um, I always go to this, what is it called? Basics or not basics, but like fundamentals. Yeah. The fundamentals page where they are like probably the first uh, articles and the first tutorials. Yeah. And then I would do, based on what I wanted to do, I would do all of them. And then I found one with the video and then I played the video. I think it was the one about making snow or stuff like that in your images. Okay. And I was like, God damn, this guy is does this super good blog but the videos are off like <laughs> rather 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 stick to the instructions because <laughs> no, i video, would like the, you, the you, videos I, were st- i think ahead. they're time lapses right like they're super quick some of them are i yeah honestly, i have no idea i have not looked at any of these videos in years I'm I'm disgusted by them i'm embarrassed by them but i will never take them down and they'll always be up there for the world to see but i just i i cringe when i <laughs> look no at but they weren't like the quality <laughs> wasn't bad but like you would because they were time lapse i remember and there was this um one um video or what one article that i couldn't couldn't figure out so i saw there was like a video and i would try to stop at the exact oh, yeah. spot where you were doing the crucial thing that i didn't understand but because it was so quick it was really hard to pick the frame <laughs> so but maybe it was good for you youtube or big algorithm because people would like <laughs> move it back and forth <laughs> but uh yeah that that um that that was really funny no but it's like as i said it was extremely helpful and especially for like because a lot of like, um, it's a really good topic to talk to um, to architects and designers because we do design and when you're especially a student or beginning your career, maybe you're in the competition team of a company, um, this is like the main thing you want to do. You want to do like really dope drawing uh, and in university also like the professors, they really expect you to do like really some cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, so you kind of was like this holy grail where you go and then like finally I get some and also because I don't know how it is in the States but here in Europe we have like um, some classes but they don't teach you like really stuff step by step they tell you some really basic stuff and you have to figure out on your own how Photoshop works how to do it so the only way that you would learn it like now there are many YouTube channels but before yeah. it was like, okay, one person knew one thing and you would go went to them and then one person used one software and and this is how you how you learn. So having something that's really structured was extremely, extremely um helpful. So and yeah. I I still don't get that's exactly how it was here in the States is they just didn't teach this stuff. I mean every all, every student was just on their own to figure it out. And to this day, I still don't really get why they don't emphasize it a little bit more. Um, but then you think about it, like the bigger offices, they all outsource all their image making. So I kind of get, you know, like the bigger offices, less of a need to have people internally doing this work. But then the, the smaller offices, I mean, you, it's so it's such a big part of like what you do presenting it to the clients and to i don't know it's 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 selling your work and trying to do it in an elegant way i i just don't get why i my so i went four years for my bachelor's and then three years for my master's so seven years of school i only remember one class where they touched on this you know uh, it's mind-boggling to me and so there was definitely like i saw there was a vacuum because me trying to learn this stuff, I there's nowhere to go. I, I learned all of what I know from going to graphic design websites and kind of learning how they were doing stuff and then kind of bringing that into the architectural world um, in terms of uh, architecture visualization, like learning how they did this thing to a person or an object or 
so, something and then applying that to a building kind of thing. Um, and I, I think it was uh, extremely good also that um, your website wasn't so like deep in, it was uh, just breaking down one aspect. So yeah. it was not like um, breaking down the whole image, but each section would be on a different part of the image. Like for example, how to do the uh, shadow of a person or how to do snow or how to do... And this kind of forced you to experiment a lot because you would like learn one technique about doing snow and then you would think, hmm, maybe I can use this for doing rain and maybe I can use this just yeah. to do a different lighting and maybe I just... Um, and nowadays also going back to the topic of the beginning of the conversation, we have all these like tutorials mentality. So I have like the... Um, I feel like people are more afraid of experimenting, you know, they just do the tutorial and they're like, sure. mm, yeah, that's it. Like now I'm going to do it forever like this. Uh, for example, I have uh, like I started doing the podcast and I had to learn all this stuff about things that I've never done before, like audio, video. And uh, by doing it in a very slower pace and uh, organically, I would learn every single little thing that you have to do separately so that now I kind of know how to build the pieces together and still often doesn't work out but it's I think it's important to keep yourself with an open end right so that you don't have the pre-structured always the pre-structured way of doing things because that stops um, experimentation and, and well not only that too you just need to get the reps in like you need to spend the time and just put the time in, uh, I think there's too many, you're right. There's, there's a ton of content out there now, a ton of tutorials. And I think people go into a lot of this thinking, I'm just going to look at a tutorial and then kick out exactly what I want. And that's not really how it works. Like the tutorials are giving you the tools, how to do it. We still need to like put in the time and build up that like sensitivity to just all the subtle things that go on in an image, like the lighting and the narrative and composition and all the stuff that is like this intuitive thing that you build in your head over a long period of time of doing this just a ton. Um, and I, it goes back to like the whole TikTok, Instagram. It's just like, uh, everyone's just getting this, this boost and, you know, the attention spans going down and they just want to like get stuff quick. There's no like putting in the, there's less of that. I feel nowadays of just putting in that time and like putting in the reps and doing, I mean, I must've worked on thousands of image images at this point. Um, and it's just, it builds like this ability to, I don't know, see it like when you get ready to start an image, you can look at an image now, or I can look at an image now and I kind of have all these ideas of where it can go and how to get there. And you kind of see it in your head before you even start. And the cool thing is you can get to that. You can like make that thing you see in your head. Like, you know that you have the tools and you can, can kind of see it. Whereas like a lot of these people, they're going online and they're looking at these tutorials and they think, okay, I, I got this tutorial, I'll get there. And it's so hard for them to actually get to that thing that they see in their head. Yeah, for yeah. me, it's a little freaky because I work on like built projects. So what happens to me is I would sit somewhere and I would start looking at the facade and seeing some details and thinking... Hmm, they did this probably because of this and this looks like this because of this and it's like really weird because I look like a super nerd when I start talking <laughs> about it to someone like ah Joe was just looking at this uh, mullion facade and if you notice here it's a little bit la lower because of this <laughs> it's like really <laughs> really really nerdy uh, but you mentioned like TikTok and the new way of communicating uh, that especially also the gen z start using mostly um what is your vision for uh, for the future of the blog are you and also because now we talk about the fact that you are uh, trying to avoid getting sucked into social media and um, do you have like uh, some plan of adapting and evolving the blog for like the new 
so to say communication tools or you want to stick to your like um to your identity that's been so far i i think it's definitely going to be um kind of sticking to my identity um one of the issues i've had recently among all the other things i was describing you know with kids getting older and uh, me getting burnt out with social media and stuff is I just, I'm having, I'm having trouble. Like I'll get these ideas in my head and it's like, I'll make it and then I'm not excited about it. And I'm having like images that I'm creating for my website are very different than the images I'm creating, uh, at the office. Cause at the office, I there's like, you kind of know what the client expectations are. You kind of have all these lists and variables that the client wants in the images. And it's very, it's just like very linear. You can create it and you're done and the client's happy. Whereas with my personal work on the website, it's like the images are never done. And, um, it's like, I, I want to keep raising the bar and I'm getting to the point where I was almost driving myself crazy with these images. I would just sit there and nitpick and rework and it was getting really bad. And I, I don't know, it, you know, again, it's, it could all be going back to, you know, looking at all the stuff on the Instagram and seeing all that work and okay, I want to do a step above or I want to do something a little bit different, or I just want this to be the perfect image. I want it to just be amazing. And like I, the last image I did, I remember just picking the view. It would take me like a day to pick a view, (laughs) just sitting there. I would pick hundreds of views, do quick test renders to see if that was the right view. And then I might pick a view and then I might start, you know, developing it in Photoshop and then abandon it and go to a different view. And then once I would finally land on a view, I would develop it in Photoshop and just sit there and nitpick with it and spend days and days working it and reworking it. Um, I get to the end of the, the process where I'm doing the final like color tweakings or lighting tweakings. And I would sit there and just mess with it for hours and I was like driving myself crazy. I felt like I was going nuts and I, I just had to like, stop, you know, take, take like a, a year off and just like, all right, this is getting out of hand. I was like becoming too much of a perfectionist. I, I don't know what it was, um, but I definitely lost that like creative excitement kind of mode of, okay, just make an image, see what, see what comes out of it be finished with it, move on to the next thing. Like I, I was definitely out of that mode. Yeah. This is also one thing that's a little bit driving me crazy about this uh, kind of work too, because I was the same when I was uh, studying, for example, because as you mentioned before, you always compare yourself to the images you find online. And yeah. when you're a student, you're just over um, motivated but you don't know yet that, for example, behind those projects, there is a work of, I don't know, multiple people that are probably more skilled than you are at that point. And um, this drives you to do overnight shifts and stuff like that, which are comp- like at, uh, on the long term, they make you disenchant with, uh, with the craft. And this is definitely something that you don't want to experience. But the images that you do for the websites, because there are some images that are just like purely put there to show how you've done them. And I don't know, there are uh, different, uh, different things that you have posted. Like uh, there was one house in the woods. Uh, there are different buildings, interiors, exteriors. Um, are those projects that you do for work why those uh, projects that you do yourself uh, for the pure purpose of um, doing it for the for the for example, you have this Texas aerial. Um, yeah. It, Texas, yeah, those are all just personal um, projects. So I still miss being an architect. I still miss designing. Um, and at the office, you know, there's. There's a lot of situations where 
a client will come and they'll just give us massing and they'll, it'll be like an urban planning project where they're designing the, the planning of the campus, but not necessarily the specifics of the architecture. And so they'll come to us and we, we can create stuff and fill all that in. That's great. But like with the website, like I love just creating these designs. So it's all just fake. It's all um, stuff I've come up with. The earlier stuff was the projects I did in school. So the design projects I did for studios and stuff, (coughs) I would uh, revisit those and kind of develop images around them, you know, long after the fact, like long after I was out of school, I went back to these projects and redeveloped them. But like the stuff I'm doing now, like that prairie um, the office prairie building. Um, it's just like ideas that come in my head. I'm like, okay, this would be cool to explore. And then uh, who knows, maybe I'll get some really cool images and diagrams and sections out of them. So they're kind of all built to generate really interesting visualization. And um, I'm always thinking about, okay, what are like some cool diagrams that I can develop that will kind of explain these projects in a, a unique way. So it, it's all just design for it, not necessarily for the visualization, but kind of just another creative outlet that I, I get to have. And how do you, <laughs> how do you motivate yourself to do it without the uh, pressure that usually you have, whether if it's like uh, when you're a student, you have to hand in the project for your, for your, so to say, professor at the end of the <laughs> semester if it's your yeah. client, you have a set up deadline and we all know that when it's a personal project that it's, as you said, really endless, um, you have to sort of push yourself. Um, so is there, yeah. is, do you have difficulties at all doing this or when do I you do, do it? Now. And now you do. So again, like I, I'm really good at setting my own deadlines um, or I used to be. And like with these projects, I would set these deadlines and I would just build the model and I would say, okay, you have one week to develop this design because you can't sit here and spend two months designing something. You, you got to make the design so that you can start visualizing it. Um, so I would set all these internal deadlines and I was really good at sticking to them because I needed to kick out something for the website, you know, every couple of weeks. And so the, the, you know, generating something for the website, every two or three weeks was like my deadline that I would set. And so that's how that worked. But then like I was saying earlier, like nowadays it's very hard for me to kind of accept the design. Like I, I would set like a week for me to design this project and that week would come and I'd be like, I need another week to keep working on this. And I just kept extending it and I could not get to a place where I was happy with the design i was i again i was like going crazy i was going insane and so i'm where i'm at right now is trying to uh get control of that a little bit and kind of get back to where i used to be where it's like stop caring so much about this stuff because a little bit of that is good it pushes you to keep getting better and keep uh keep working hard and and whatnot, but too much of it is really bad and it just destroys production and all that. So I'm trying to get back to that balanced state of not caring too much. I need to like, just accept that this is never going to be perfect or it's never going to be exactly what I want and just move on, um, get to a better like mental state with all this, this stuff. And this is only with like my personal work with the office work. It's weird. I'm completely different it's so easy for me to just get what the client wants, generate an image. They're almost always happy with it. Like he, I'm, we've gotten, our office has gotten really good at like reading kind of what clients want and what kind of client it is and how to work with them. And so it's very easy to just get to that point and the client is happy and move on. But <clears throat> with my personal work, it's just the exact opposite. It's not pretty. <laughs> but how do you, um, like, okay, that's, uh, now we, we talked about this topic and you said that, but how do you do it? Because you have a full-time job uh, in a visualization office, which we all know it's usually not the classic nine to five. Maybe even if you force yourself, you 
it's difficult to do it nine to five. Uh, and um, you said you have two kids. Uh, I, I assume that before they were here around, even if they're young, uh, you had a partner or wife or girlfriend that you have to spend time with. So did you, you were you used to like wake up pretty early to do it in the morning before you work? Or did you do it on the weekends? Or And how did you balance the time um, <coughs> between doing these side projects and spending time, for example, with your family? Because yeah. as someone that does something on the side, I know how uh, sometimes you feel frustrated. Because, I mean, I still also have a job. I have to work to in order yeah. to pay my bills. and then But I don't want to sort of let myself just go with the life without trying to do anything extra because it's not my my thing uh, yeah. but at the same time i have to decide if i want to sacrifice the time for doing my side project or to spend time with my girlfriend uh, so it's sometimes very you know it's um, again this analysis paralysis what should i do yeah. and um, how did you organize yourself in that sense and how did you manage this stress it's, so it's definitely been changing. You know, when I first started the website <clears throat> before the kids, um, especially when I was working at the architect's office, um, I would mostly work on it on weekends. And it was like every weekend. Um, maybe like once, the, once I moved to uh, doing visualization full time, one thing I will say about our office is we are very – focus on not doing overtime. Like we were an eight to five office, no weekend work. And we just, it, we, we know how much we can handle and we turn down once we meet that threshold, we turn down any other work. So we turn down quite a bit of work just so we can have our weekends and everyone can leave at five. So that's, that's been really good. But what I was doing, you know, when the kids were younger is I would leave the office, come home and immediately go to production for my website and then spend weekends all day, Saturday, all day, Sunday working on this stuff. And at a certain point, I was posting maybe once every couple of weeks, then that moved to every th three weeks because I... I was switching to, okay, a couple weekends on, one weekend off. And then I started switching to, okay, I'll post something every month. So I give myself four weeks to create a new image or a new work so that I could have two weekends off and two weekends working on this stuff. Um, but again, it, it just, with the kids getting older, my priorities are shifting and it's just no longer all about the website it's it's now all about the kids and where does the website kind of fit in and in the case of this last year it just doesn't fit in like i just i, I stopped took it took a year off and just and the thing is i'm really liking this life now <laughs> of i miss the website but i'm loving having these weekends free and like coming home from the office and having my afternoons to like have dinner and go play with the kids and do stuff like that. Oh, and I will say, so there's another part of my life that we haven't talked about, which is like, I love building stuff. So we bought this home and I've just been, I have all of these tools down in the basement and I, I, I've redone uh, two bathrooms. I put in a new kitchen. I've, put in all kinds of molding and woodworking built in cabinets all throughout this house. So like I've like switched modes from digital to analog of like working with my hands and building stuff. And I like, I love doing that stuff. So, you know, if there's this option of building something with my hands or going up to the office and working on the computer, I almost always choose working with my hands and building something and so it's it's been really really hard <laughs> to kind of go to the office, work all day on the computer making images, and then come home and continue to do that. It's it's like so much more rewarding to go build something physically or play with the kids or, or something along those lines. 
So priorities are shifting, essentially. Yeah. Well, I suggest you to do like um, documentation of step by step DIY, <laughs> like uh, architecture from uh, visualizing it to building it. Um, it would be fun, like to. I guess that you do some sort of drawings before you draw your before you build your cabinets or your kitchen. So oh no, I do. So that's <laughs> that's the cool part is like I have a whole three D model of our house and I have designed every square inch of this house in 3D, done test renderings. And so I know what I'm creating before I even create it, which is pretty cool. And then I, you know, you kind of how you're talking, like you really love like seeing that thing built, like you designing a building and seeing it built. I never had that with like, when I worked for the architect and I would work on these projects and we would, the building would get built. I was so exhausted with like the carpentry stuff and like putting in a kitchen, it's opposite. Because I, I run on my own time and these projects are, you know, like the kitchen was a month and a half. Like I designed this thing and then I built it in a month and a half. And man, the excitement I got out of, out of that, like building this exact thing I wanted in our house was so, it was so rewarding. Um, so yeah, uh, I don't know necessarily if the visualization uh, audience would find that as interesting as I do, but um, that's definitely where my head's at right now. Well, you could do a separate section, like it'd be like extra, like bonus. If you love it, good. If you don't, good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. Uh, but I think that uh, if you had done like architecture work on your own, like not for uh, this architecture office, I think you would um, you would have loved it more. And I think this is also my personal goal to at some point uh, do my own office and do my own um, projects because I think that one, as you said like if you're designing your house and it is for you and you're doing by yourself yeah. you feel so rewarded at the end of the of the work when you see it there and I think if you were doing architecture for other people but be on behalf yourself like as a main architect probably would you would have um loved it more uh because it's i don't know it's like making coffee for someone right like when you or making food for someone if you make the food despite you're not eating it you're happy to see that people are enjoying it and um yeah, for sure, and, for and sure. It's, it's gonna be it's it's gonna be the same with especially with the house like um i one thing also that makes me very happy is when uh, for example, we design some office building or something and there's some part of the office building that after that we hear, I don't know, the people are really enjoying it. And I know I've given some of the ideas and they're working. That's really, really it's like really re rewarding because uh, good design, it's always like um, kind of invisible, right? It's there yeah. and uh, you it's not invading your space, but just by being so well fun functioning and well looking and good looking then people are um people are happy but um you said you have a 3d model of your house i wouldn't share that online because then people will know every <laughs> single inch of your house but what is the um, workflow uh that you're doing is it still like back in the days i remember you would do like also sometimes rough sketch up models with heavy photoshop um and my knowledge is that that kind of SketchUp was completely uh, changed a little bit because I think Google sold it or something like that. There is this new yeah. SketchUp with a blue icon that I've tested one and it was really weird to use. Uh, <laughs> they kind of ruined it. Yeah. They kind of ruined it for me. I've never been like a huge SketchUp fan. Um, yeah. But... Um, so what is what is the workflow? Because I know mainly the architecture visualization office they use rather three D Studio Max or yeah. uh, Cinema Four D, but mainly three uh, D S Max. Um, so what is the workflow? Do you still do a SketchUp and Photoshop or something yeah, else? Yeah, everything's still SketchUp. Um, we render in V-Ray, um, V-Ray for SketchUp, so it's a plugin inside of SketchUp. Um, versus like a standalone V-Ray um, and then Photoshop. And, you know, the thing is, is it's SketchUp has largely unchanged. 
it hasn't changed much since it was like first created. I, but the amount of content created around SketchUp, like the amount of plugins, the amount of like even with how V-Ray interacts with SketchUp has gotten, I mean, miles and miles better. And so we can do stuff now that even like five years ago we couldn't do. And definitely like 10 years ago was not even possible. Like uh, just like with how, like one thing SketchUp I think does really well is it handles really large files. Like if you build them correctly, you can like, we do huge like city master plans, um, campus master plans where we'll like, build out like huge chunks of these universities with like a lot of detail and we'll dump in these really big textures and throw a ton of proxy trees and cars and 3d people all over. And we're able to really manage these large files really well. Whereas in the past, you know, five, even five years ago, like it, it was, we were kind of re we we were always kind of pushing the limits of what SketchUp and V-Ray could do. And now I feel like um, we, we don't really reach those limits. Like it's, it just keeps getting more and more capable. And it also helps too. like, we're running much, much bigger computers now. And so we're just able to handle like huge swaths of data. Um, so I, you know, and the, the the reason why I always use SketchUp and V-Ray in the past is like I'm I'm not a big technical person, so like SketchUp and V-Ray had the lowest barrier to entry, and I could get to where I wanted image wise the quickest using those tools and Photoshop, obviously. Um, and I've just you know there's been times where we've kind of reached the limit of what we could do, and we've considered switching to something else, 3D Studio Max or, or whatever. Um, but then, like, V-Ray would release new updates. Like, they haven't been doing uh, real-time for that long uh, inside of V-Ray for SketchUp. So, like, they kept, like, releasing more capable software, and so we just kind of kept staying with it. Um, and now we're, we're actually really happy with what we're able to do. Um, so I don't really see myself or the office switching anytime soon from this. Cause we, we have all these huge libraries now set up of all the stuff that's ready to go in our SketchUp models in terms of proxies and textures and how things are built. Um, the other issue is we're doing so many images a year, like hundreds of images a year. And we have this whole infrastructure set up on these older images that when clients come to us and need us to make changes to something we did a year ago or two years ago, we need to still make sure we have this whole infrastructure set up so that we can update and make changes. Or, you know, there's a lot of situations where we did <clears throat> five or six images a year ago, and then they come back and they say, okay, we want five or six more. And so we need to go back into our archives, kind of go back into those models, reset new images or new views. And so there's also kind of this kind of issue of, you know, we have this momentum in the software we're using now and this whole ecosystem around it to switch now would actually be quite painful and quite difficult. Um, but I also don't really see a need for us to switch at the moment. I'm still able to kind of kick out what I want to kick out in terms of image quality. Yeah, definitely. And your office design is still, um, I mean, where you're working at, where your partner at, um, does it work uh, only with U.S. clients mainly or is it working internationally? And also, um, how many people are you? Because I guess that also one thing that you have to have in an office is that everybody have more or less the same um, workflow. So I guess that right. if some person comes to the team, they will need to adapt to what it's, yep. this infrastructure is set up. Yeah, so our clients, I would say, let me think here. It used to be that half our clients were in Boston, like big architecture firms in Boston, and then the other half was kind of spread around the United States. Um, we really don't get it a lot of clients outside of the United States. And it's not that 
we don't want it. It's just that w- most of our clients come from inside the United States for whatever reason that is. Um, I would say now we uh, maybe it's 25% of our clients are here in Boston and 75 now are just spread out around the United States. And a lot of that is like, you know, for example, like an office like Perkins and Will, they have a branch in Boston. They have a branch in Atlanta. They have a branch in Texas. They have a branch in Chicago. They have these branches all over. And we now are working. We started out with maybe the branch in Atlanta and then our word got passed to the branch in Texas and um, Chicago. And now we're doing work for all these different teams in all these different States and that's how it is for a lot of the bigger clients like the Perkins and Wills, um, Gensler's, those types of offices. And then when these architects in these other states see these images, then they end up reaching out to us. And so we have lots of relationships with like smaller offices in all these different places all around the United States. So word of mouth has definitely traveled quite a bit. And so we're doing a lot less work just focused here in Boston. And then there's a lot of projects where we're doing something for Perkins and will that they're designing something in Europe or, or some other country. So it's not necessarily the images we're making are for projects here in the United States. A lot of the images are international, um, but the clients themselves are mostly here in the States. Well, I guess also there are like certain aesthetics that are like yes. you guys do that <laughs> it's like, uh, I mean, uh, by speaking to many people in the architecture industry and archivist industry, there is a certain different type of aesthetics if you do an image, for example, for the United Kingdom or for Dubai or for the States or for Scandinavia. Like Scandinavia will be something more like desaturated, more minimalist. Yep. Uh, on the contrary, Dubai will be something really flashy. UK is also some somehow that way. So there is a certain different aesthetic. And uh, uh, yeah, no, no joke. Uh, last week, we were just kind of joking around in the office that the only images we do are sunny days and dusky nights, like. No rainy days, no fog, no like wet ground. Um, it's like we d- early on in the office, like when the office was just getting going, we would constantly be trying to push these different environments, like different types of lighting, like foggy, rainy, whatever. And we were just getting pushed back or just told no over and over again. And so now it's just, we just default to bright sunny day or like dusky, cozy uh, sun below the horizon time of day. And like, it's, that's what everybody wants here in the States. At least that's what everyone wants is this. They want these perfect uh, weather conditions like they just want to people to see their projects either like just the most perfect bright sunny day or the most perfect dusky mood where lights are turning on in the buildings and it's cooled off a little bit and everyone's just kind of out and about strolling in this perfect weather that's all they want um, and so it's like uh, we've just stopped even trying to push these other like environments anymore it's it, we just get told no too much i don't know you're making me think about funny compositions you could do like um for the visual, visualizing architecture like i don't know the project with some homeless people tan cap <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in the foreground <laughs> or like something more realistic <laughs> no I, it's all like um this this world of everything's perfect kind of thing, you know, definitely not like you're saying, you know, like, um, you know, like a mirror type image where it's just so much emotion and like, we just can't get away with that here. There's just, we, we get told no too much. I now mirror mirror is able to do 
like they're able to take like a like a bright sunny day and they're able to really do some amazing things with a bright sunny day or like a like they're able to really still be uh smart and creative with those types of day but even like that first one at the top that you just showed like that would be on the right that's still not bright and sunny enough. Like we would have to get warmth in that image. Like it's too uh, desaturated and gray. Like it's, it's, it's nuts um, how much we're just pushed to make it warm. The, the uh, daytime images are supposed to be warm and bright and sunny. We just, uh, we were doing a project and they asked us to do a fall shot, which we were super excited about talking about this image from um, Mir that I really loved because it was like such a, a scene that you could relate to and it was not something like you said like a fancy sunny sky or putting like a classic uh, very pretty woman in the foreground or something like that uh, so that was um, it, it's really they do a really good job by by um, composition and of course they do this ultra realistic stuff um, but by by being so your website being so popular, and you can imagine it's particularly popular in the United States. Um, have you been invited maybe to teach or to sp speak at universities? So about these topics, or yeah, um, before the pandemic, I was actually doing quite a bit. Um, I was trying to limit to about two kind of talks or presentations. Um, a semester <clears throat> and then the pandemic hit and everyone wanted to switch to di uh, virtual kind of talks and presentations. And that's just, it's not my thing. Like I, I, I don't like doing like a zoom type uh, presentation. So I just kind of started turning stuff down. And then now with things, everything opened up again, I'm actually getting ready to, go to two universities here in the fall, um, both in October. And so there is quite a bit of that. There's like a lot of universities reaching out, asking to come do workshops, which um, it's actually a lot of fun. It's fun just kind of traveling around and seeing what different universities are doing. Um, there has been a couple of uh, places reaching out to teach, but it's just not something – I have the time to do. There's no way I would ever be able to fit something like that into my schedule. So um, definitely I've had the option, but I've turned it down. Um, I think the workshops and the lectures are like a nice little in-between where I can kind of go to these places, meet new people, see kind of what kind of work they're doing, but it's only just a short period of time. I'm not using up a ton of vacation. I can get back home and spend more time with the kids and stuff. So yeah, it's, uh, it, I, you know, giving presentations and lecturing and stuff like that's not, <laughs> if there's one thing to know about me, I am the most introverted person ever. Like I love just like being home. Um, so it's definitely, I, I have to override a lot of my instincts on this. Like it, I remember hearing like a long time ago, just don't say no so much, like just say yes to things that make you uncomfortable. And so that's why like, I'm just as much as like, I, it's not necessarily, I don't want to do it. It's just, I, I would much prefer to just stay home <laughs> versus doing all this traveling and like doing lectures and whatnot. I still just say yes to as much as I can just to force myself to kind of keep doing this. Cause it's good. I'm always happy. I did it after the fact. Um, it's just a lot of overriding <laughs> what my brain is telling me to do. Uh, it's so funny that you say this because I I would love to have some some of that in my daily the career life. So to say that once in a while I travel somewhere, and um, in Italy we have a way of saying who has the teeth doesn't have the the bread <laughs> 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 and vice versa. <laughs> so it's like you always. <laughs> Like when you have something, you're like, ah, I don't need it. And other people that would love to have it, uh, 
God damn, I'm not getting it. But um, because <laughs> I, 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 I don't have to, I don't, I don't get to speak to too many people from the States. Um, how is the situation with like, because uh, you mentioned you studied in, in Miami also, like are architectural tuitions also one of those extremely expensive one that you end up with huge student debt in the States or is it still doable? I mean, I've had some people from the States, but um, the one we had studied way back in the days and the other one was a girl that works at big New York and she got like, uh, she got a, uh, what is it called? Like a um, student, um, not a loan, uh, but she got like some financial support because she was a... Sure. Yeah, extremely talented girl. So is it like, because for us in Europe, especially in Central, in the European Union, so to say, we don't get this concept of a student loan and student debt because more or less in every single country here, studying it's almost for free, let's say. Like it's somehow, it's, nice. it's, it's not for, like in Germany, I can tell you in Germany it's for free. Because we, you pay like 400 euros a semester, which is $400 now. And you get like a ticket with which you can go into museums, whether for free or for lower prices. You can go to the cinema on certain days for lower prices. You can travel all the public transportation for free. And so out of this $400, um, I think something like 50 or 100 goes to the university. And everything else, it's sort of supported. That is yeah, crazy. No, and it's, uh, and it's in Italy, it's different. In Italy, because I studied both in Germany and Italy, and in Italy, it was like based on your family income. If you're part of a family, like I think it, everything is based on the country, and because Italy, it's more like structured. Like you stay with your family until you're not done with. Um, I, I think you count part of your family as long as you're living on the same address. So, um, or as long as you're registered on the same address. So it's based on your family income. So if you come from a rich family, I think the maximum you can pay was 3000 euros a semester, uh, which is $3,000. And uh, it, there were different like levels based on whether you're poor or rich. And then you have the books, of course, but you can always go to the library, get a book, and then figure out which is the one coffee sh uh, one copy shop that don't care and just go and make a photocopy of it. And like it's it's like you can, uh, ironically, you can you can study even if you don't come from from like a super rich family, which is so funny yeah. because you would think the opposite based on the American dream. So <laughs> I'm curious, like. How it is the situation with architecture schools in the states? Uh, it's definitely the opposite. Um, <laughs> it's a we have like a messed up mindset here, which is it's just an expectation that to go to college you just get into a you take on a huge amount of debt. Like that's just what everyone does. We we have an issue with debt in general here in the states, like in terms of using credit cards and stuff, just it's an expectation that everybody just runs up a ton of debt on stuff. But universities is one of the, the biggest issues. Obviously it's like a big political thing right now. Um, but like, for example, a, it depends a lot on what school you go to. So if you go to like a bigger, well-known, more respected school, you're going to be paying double or triple of what a smaller, much smaller school, less known would cost. But even with that, I remember um, I applied to four universities um, back in, uh, so when I was trying to get my master's, I applied to four different places. Um, so this was in 2007. I remember one school was going to cost 40k a year, forty thousand dollars a year. Forty thousand dollars a year. Yes, that was for three years. It's like three um, cars, good one, like Mustang. <laughs> the the other school was thirty thousand a year, uh, or two of them was was thirty thousand a year, and then the one I went to, um, 
the reason I went there is they offered an assistantship, which meant like I could work in like at the library. I ended up working at, in the workshop of, uh, at Miami university. This is Miami university of Ohio, not Miami, like Miami dolphins, Florida. This is Miami, Ohio. Um, but they, I were, I worked in the wood shop, which is where I learned all my carpentry and stuff that I do in my house now. And they, that covered half of my tuition, just doing that um, several hours a week. So that's ultimately why I went to Miami. Um, but I think nowadays things have gotten even more expensive. I know there's schools that are probably like 60000 a year, if not more. Um, so what do you get leaving. that for? Like, do you get it pure? Do you get everything included in that least? Like, do you have to still then buy books and stuff like that? Or so um, usually it includes uh, housing. So like, if you're staying in a dorm, mm. um, sometimes uh, that's usually for undergraduate. Graduate programs usually don't have you don't stay in dorms, so you gotta cover the cost of your housing. Um, it usually, sometimes it includes food. Sometimes it doesn't almost always. It doesn't include books. That's just like tuition. Man. That's incredible. <laughs> it's, it's, it's nuts. So there's so many people that are great. So now there's ways to get, um, scholarships and that kind of stuff, but it, it never covers the entire cost or even like a large proportion of it. And not everyone gets scholarships. So, uh, so many, just about all students are graduating with huge amounts of debt, but a lot of them are like six figure debt, like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that's kind of the issue is like everyone that's graduating, they're trying to start life out and they already have essentially a mortgage. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, without owning a house, they like, they're just, they're, they're paying these huge amounts of monthly costs. And on top of that, they got to somehow get their lives started and start buying houses and, and having kids and stuff. And they're just already like so far behind. But my logic would say, okay, they have studied, they've paid a bunch of um, money for tuition and I mean, if we don't count also the money that they didn't earn in that time because they were studying, uh, would lead me to the to thinking that uh, Amer in America, an architect would earn a lot of money in order to be able to easily, like not easily, but at least comfortably pay back this debt or is not that the case? Because here in Germany, on average, you go between, let's say if you're a beginner, you would start around... 40k let's say a year uh, and after taxes that goes down to maybe 30 something or 30 and then if you're advanced you can go up to i don't know 90k a year something like that uh, which after taxes will be like i don't know 50 maximum um yeah I don't know, is it more or less the same wage in America for architects or is it way more so that, I mean, it makes sense to no, go study? It, it, a, it definitely depends on where it's at. Like if you're in a big city like New York or Boston, like you might start out at, you know, right out of school is you're probably starting out at 70. Mm -hmm. Um I'm not in that world anymore, so I, yeah. I know less about it. But uh, when we're hiring people, we kind of have to have a little bit of perspective on what architecture offices are paying because we're sometimes competing against them in terms of people. Um, and then I, you know, depending on how far you, it, it also depends. Is it a big office? If you're working your way up in a big office, you'll definitely get in the six figures after like, you know, four or five years. But when you're living in a city like Boston, the salaries are higher, but that's because the cost of living is so much higher. Yeah. And so like rent for like, you know, in the, so I live in a town that's just outside of Boston um, I still take the bus in. So like, I'm still connected to the city through public transportation and whatnot, but like, 
Um, if I were trying to rent a place in this town, it would be three or 4,000 a month. So like, again, you may be making more, but you're paying so much more in rent or trying, you can't even buy a house. Houses are so expensive here now. Like you, it's almost impossible for someone out of school to buy a place. And then on top of that, now you have hundreds of thousands of dollars in student loans that you're also trying to pay off along with trying to pay these huge high rents. Um, it just, it, it, I don't know, like people are paying off student loans for like 20 or 30 years. I mean, it's just, it's, it's like lasting such a huge chunk of their life. So then, you know, in the news recently, um, Biden, uh, president Biden paid off like $10,000. I mean, that's just a drop in the bucket for a lot of these people. Like, How that's much did he pay? 10000 Well, that's like, I don't know, not even a semester. <laughs> right. Well, so for some, for some people, you know, they're not going to these big schools or they're not getting architecture degrees. Like the, the, their loans might be twenty or 30000 in which case that would make a, a big difference. But, you know, for a lot of other people, people I know, I, I don't know of a lot of people that have student loans less than 50 or 60,000. A lot of them are over a hundred thousand in student loans, in which case this 10,000 just doesn't really. But this do is much. like ridiculous because I mean, and I guess that uh, you have some sort of interest on that loan. So it's yes. not actually, it's even more. And yep. um, yeah, this is like for me, cause I, um, I'm originally from Bulgaria, which is an Eastern European country, and I was born in the 90s. So, for I grew up like with uh, really the American dream, just because like watching American movies and American, uh, yeah, everything was coming from the States, and it was looking so much flashier and so much like different than what was surrounding us. That it was been it's been always like so fascinating and. And now I listen to a lot of uh, podcasts from the United States, like the Joe Rogan Experience. There is the Lex Friedman Show, and and they discuss yeah, sometimes this topic. Listen topics. to those all the time. And it's weird because it feels sometimes um, crazy that I, it feels like the people in America live in their own bubble. Like they think if like we have rather socialism or capitalism. But I mean, I live in Germany and in Italy, and they're definitely not socialist countries. Um, but I feel it's fair to give the opportunity to every single person to go to a higher education and improve their life status um, instead of labeling that as a socialism, because it's it's not. It's actually, if you would think about it, it would be like the most American thing to do, because what is your like let's say if you're from a family that's not so wealthy what is your fault for it you have to have like the opportunity at least to try to get better and um it, in this condition it's extremely difficult because i personally also don't come from a very wealthy family and we sacrifice all the sacrificable even for this little tuition like i wouldn't have an iphone for example but i would go to to university and um and i think it's a little bit sad i we don't in europe we don't get two things from the states like the student thing no three student uh <laughs> debt uh health health insurance how how it's possible that you don't have it like uh, it's yeah. i mean i guess it's right to have like if even in europe we have like this mixed system so if you want to go to this one super good doctor then you have to have your own money and go and pay or you have like an insurance that will cover that you won't die like and and also you we have like um if you're sick you have like sick days so it doesn't count like we don't have limit on sick days if you're sick you're sick um yeah. and that was crazy and, and also the guns thing like <laughs> it's just ridiculous <laughs> Like uh, I, I'm coming to the states and I'm gonna be driving a car, so I, I'll show like a couple of tutorials. What do you need to do when you you get pulled over, pulled over? If you get pulled over, because here we never think like, oh, I have to keep my I don't know 
my hands visible or stuff like that or the like if uh it's like extremely rare that police officers shoot someone or kill someone just for the simple fact that just a very few people might have a gun and and they will own it illegally so they probably deserve to be shot if that happens but um yeah so it's really to me it's really fascinating to 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 learn more about these things from from somebody that leaves them because i think maybe i'm biased because i live in this system i mean so, well so go, going back to like the student loan thing i think there's like a big cultural thing where we just have to get ourselves out of this mindset because you, there are ways to go to college for much, much cheaper, but it's like this, this kind of like this dumb status thing of like, I want to go to this cool university because they have a badass football team and they have an amazing uh, amenities, uh, amazing gyms, student centers. And so all my friends are spending thousands and thousands of dollars to go here. So, you know, I'm going to do the same thing because I want to go where my friends are. There's this momentum that it's just like, that's what you do when you graduate high school, you go to the, the most exciting university you can. And there's just, I think there's too much money wrapped up in all of this, like when you talk about like health insurance and that kind of stuff, the system we have here is just so nuts, but there's, I mean, we're not even talking billions. We're talking trillions of dollars wrapped up in how this is set up and trying to undo this and set up something new. It's just not realistic. Like it's, it's not going to happen. Um, and so it's the same with the universities. I mean, these universities, they're paying like football coaches millions of dollars, like almost more than NFL coaches. Like that's how big this stuff has gotten. And so of course you're going to keep charging insane tuitions. Like what is, what is the government going to do? Like it's all, it's just, there's, there's too much money. It, and it's somehow the culture of, stop spending all this money on education or, you know, you can go to this college over here. That's one tenth of it. It's obviously it doesn't have the same name and it doesn't have all these amenities and it doesn't have an amazing football coach, but you're not also going to be leaving with a ton of debt and just no one here wants to do that. They want to go to the exciting university. I, and, and if you think if you want to become like an archivist artist, artist, you don't even need a degree. You just need to learn the software. Basically, oh, yeah. go through your oh, website yeah. tutorials and you get to go. I mean, I, I had my choice to go to a bunch of really cool universities. But like I said, they were so expensive. And this one university, I couldn't be happier going to Miami. But the reason I ultimately went was because they offered me the assistantship to work while I was there. Um, the, the, too many people just don't care about that. They, they, they're they fine building up the debt now, and then they complain once they graduate. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's bigger issues at hand than mm. it's, I can it's give, a cultural thing. I can give the suggestion to American students to come to Europe and study they can easily get a visa and it's going to be way cheaper and uh, we oh. don't have but we don't have American football teams at our universities we have no team <laughs> <laughs> my business partner Andrew his daughter is going to study in Paris and it's way 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 cheaper than anything she would have yeah. went to here and imagine that Paris is like maybe the most expensive you can get because you have to live in Paris and I guess this is a little bit more expensive. But still, like you can, I know, like I've seen documentaries here about American students going to study in countries like Slovenia or, yeah, even Slovenia, I think is completely free. So they go there and learn stuff like veterinary and, and um, yeah, they just, I mean, I think I would do that if I were like in the States and I couldn't afford to go to college and I wanted to study. And I would go somewhere else, and maybe then it's not fully recognized in the states as a degree, but still you will get something. I mean, 
all the people that get get green card and are educated they're getting like uh good jobs so i think uh <laughs> i think that's a a wise thing to do um yeah so it's it's to me it's really fascinating <laughs> that uh that it's that that is how it works in the states and i think that uh also a problem is that you guys are like in a such a huge country that before you get out of the country it takes such a long time and even if you could travel for hours by plane and you're still in the same country <laughs> and if you yeah. go on the north canada is pretty much the same uh so you have to go maybe in mexico to see something different and for us it's so much different because i can take a car and drive just three hours in direction west and i get to france and the people there would talk another language and they will have completely different culture or you fly one hour south to italy and it's a completely different con yeah. country so i think this is also something that i guess it's easy to get in your own bubble when you're in the states for sure for sure um, well, Alex, it, uh, it was super nice talking to you. We have covered uh, a lot of topics. Uh, I always say that uh, this is your first time on the podcast, but it doesn't have to be the last time. So whenever you do something interesting or you want to share your latest um, carpentry project at home, <laughs> you're always welcome back to showcase it on here. Uh, I always like to end the conversation uh in an inspirational way so i ask everybody if they would share some activity movies books uh, traveling destinations or whatever uh, that um, it's something that pumps you up to or inspires you to to be creative when you have a little bit of a dip um that's a good question i mean there's a lot of different directions i could go in terms of kind of creativity um it's been out for a little while but like i've been like we just got disney plus um <laughs> so there's a bunch of star wars content that's being created just for disney plus and so like you have the the book of boba fett um all those like series that they're making and man oh man are those just like gorgeous to watch like i'll just sit there and i the stories are good, but like I just sit there and look at the visuals and like just the environments they create and like the lighting that they set up. I mean, it's just, I mean, everything's just phenomenal. And then at the end of each one of those, each show, then they show the artist, con the concept art, um, to like the artist that design kind of what the scenes would look by look like in their concept art. Like even like the credits are just amazing to watch. Um, I don't know. Have you seen any of those? Uh, no, we don't have Disney Plus at home. And uh, for the recurring listeners, they know I'm not like um, big into Star Wars. But uh, am I. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't watched those. But I sometimes also like stuff that have great visuals and CG, CGI stuff in them because it's like super fascinating and uh, also like. Uh, seeing the lighting in specific movies or the color correction can be inspirational yeah. for like your images or for your own project. So, definitely. so yeah, I, I will say like, I don't really care about star Wars. I never have, but like the stuff that they're doing just for like television show, it's a TV series. And I think they're, they're on to like another one now. I forget what the next one is, but like, it's like the quality of production is just as amazing as like some of their best movies. I mean, it's, it's nuts. And it's just like, again, it, in some ways it's like the Instagram effect. It makes me feel worse coming away from it. Cause you, they're just doing masterful stuff. And it's like, God, why do you even try? You know, it just looks so beautiful. I got to quit looking at the good stuff. I just got to like go find a um, North of, Massachusetts, Boston, where we live, uh, there is a state called Maine and it's just like, it's beautiful, pristine, like less developed, uh, beautiful coastline and everything. I just need to like go up into Maine and just live there and just disconnect and live off the land or something. And just like really like do a restart, a reboot of, of my mind and my brain. 
I can give you a YouTube channel tip. It's called 30 by 40. Uh, I don't know if you know it. It's an architect that it lives in Maine and uh, he designs exactly those kind of houses. Um, so I would suggest you to check it out. That's called 30 by 40. Okay. Uh, it's really, he does these beautiful videos and he shows like his projects and he lives in a house completely surrounded by the woods. Uh, it's really beautiful. So I, I would do the That's same the thing. That's the way to go. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I don't know, maybe there it's a little bit cheaper to, to buy one or to build one. No, it's not. Everything's so expensive <laughs> no, it's, here. It's just <laughs> like everything is about money and you didn't monetize your website. <laughs> um, okay, Alex. So thank you very much for your time for on the weekend. And um, uh, it was a real pleasure, a real honor to talk to you personally, to have you on. And you're always welcome back. Thank you and have a good one. I just want to say too, yeah, it's been really great talking to you. I definitely let's do this again. Maybe after I, uh, I don't know, renovate another part of this house, you know, or maybe once I start back up producing stuff for my website, we can like reconvene and maybe we can discuss where my mental state is, you know, a few months from now or a year from now. Do do something in purple like the colors of the podcast <laughs> i always say that. okay all right I'll, I'll make a little nod to you <laughs> great okay have a good one thanks bye bye